we ended up building it, it through just iterative conversations based on instinct and common sense. And it worked. You know, we, we just kept going and didn't look down. And I think there was something looking back on that time, that power of trusting your instinct, conversation, keeping it lo-fi and, and listening. My name's Katrina. And I'm Steve. And we are curious about how changing conversations can change organizations. Yeah, and together with our community of transformation nerds, we're exploring how to leverage conversations to make our workplaces more fit for humans, but also more fit for the future. We'll use our podcast series to do just that, while being in conversation with business and thought leaders who have interesting perspectives on the topic. So without further ado, let's start the conversation. Today, we're in conversation with Gail Galley. Gail's background is in marketing and advertising. She's helped to create campaigns for clients ranging from P&G to the Labour Party in the UK. She's also worked in communications at the BBC for more than eight years before taking over as CEO at esteemed advertising agency Fallon London. All of this serves as a backdrop to what comes next which is when in 2015, Gail joined campaigner Richard Curtis to found Project Everyone, the campaign unit that launched the Sustainable Development Goals on behalf of the United Nations. We'll be talking with Gail about the work that Project Everyone has done to spark and fuel a global conversation. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is quite a mouthful, so we'll refer to them in this episode as the SDGs or Global Goals. Lean in and enjoy this conversation with Gail Galley. I'm going to ask you first, Steve, why have we invited Gail on this podcast? Uh, the re- well, many reasons. Uh, Gail is, is cool. My wife met you almost 10 years ago and she said, you got to meet Gail. She kicks ass and you do. Um, so because you are, you are, you are intelligent and inspiring person, but, but also because you were part of and, and, uh, instrumental in turning a boring report from the UN into something that has now changed the conversation globally in every organization I can think of today and any organization I work with, the sustainability goals are part of their narrative. It's part of their conversation. And it's a, it could be anything from a sports club to a, to a big uh, corporation. Uh, the global goals are part of the narrative. And I believe that it was thanks to the work that you and your organization did. So I'm super curious to explore how do you turn insight into a global movement? And that's what we're going to explore. So with that framing, I think it's the perfect time to say welcome, Gail. Um, thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I think your wife kicks ass. So back at you. I agree. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Could you take us back eight years and uh, and uh, maybe share with us some of the conversations that actually led to Project Everyone and and how did you get it going? So of course the glo- the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, were the successors to the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, and there were eight of those. And it's so fascinating to me that even up until then, two thousand, there were no sustainability goals. You know, the, despite everything we knew, despite uh, all the science being very clear, uh, that the, the UN was focusing its its global mandate on, sure, worthy things, hunger, education, gender, all those things, but not sustainability. So the conversation to add sustainability into the SDGs is in itself amazing that that had to happen. And and I, as I understand it, it, was quite controversial. You know, some of the bigger supporters, donors, countries who were very focused on things like hunger, you can imagine or uh, health did not want sustainability added because they thought it would dilute. So that was a conversation that was had and obviously 
resolved the way it resolved, which is sustainability is added. But when I got there, when I arrived on the scene, as it were, coming from, as I said, ad industry, so this was all new to me, um, there was still a, quite a degree of uh, sort of adversarial behaviors and conversations between the development world and the sustainability world. And they played out in the launch year um, of 2015 because it was also the year of the Paris Agreement. So it, depending on where you sat, this was either the biggest month in your life because the SDGs were launching or it was the biggest month in your life because Paris was happening. And of course, Copenhagen had not worked five years earlier. So the, there was an intense uh, build up and hope for Paris. And people were getting cross with each other because the climate lot had got the march together and this is, and how dare they do a climate march when it's the SDG launch and real tension, which was interesting to me as someone who was coming from a space where I thought, this is all one thing, right? <laughs> We're all trying to make the world better for everyone forever. But it was tense and it was interesting. And I think that the amazing defining tone to Project Everyone was that it never stepped into that conversation and it never has and it never will. For us, the goals represent a system of, uh, of unity. You know, of, it's an holistic system. You can't fix one without the other. No one wants to live on a dead planet, but equally, do we want to live on a healthy planet where women and girls don't get any kind of rep you know, recognition um, or children aren't educated, et cetera? So the conversation that we engendered was about moving forward together. How can we come together to make the world better? And it was also a crazy kind of energy it's like a start, it was a startup. It was a startup, but that energy of startup with the biggest mission in the world at the heart of it was intoxicating. So it was very easy for us to start conversations with um, big supporters, like big supporters like Bill Gates and, and the like, because we would ring up and say, hello, I'm ringing on behalf of the United Natures and Richard Curtis. Would you like to help us save the world? <laughs> and they'd be like, who are you? But I think the tone that we were um, starting with was so different to those legacy climate campaigners or uh, hunger campaigners who, you know, were tired of, and, and, and also, you know, in conflict with each other. We were like the news bunnies. We were like, hello, <laughs> would you like to help us? And, and the higher up we got and the more ambitious we were in the way we expressed that mission, the more people lent in to help. So we would just have conversations, actually, genuinely, the way we designed the launch. I'll talk about design design in a sec. That's of the icons. That would be different. But the way we designed the launch campaign was we thought, how do we reach everyone? That's why we're called Project Everyone. It was meant to be a project. We, we, we didn't realize we were going to still be here. But the launch was the goals are for everyone. Let's make them for everyone. So Richard just called this the Project Everyone. And it's as always stuck. Um, so we thought, how do you reach everyone? What are the biggest verticals in the world? And these were not scientific conversations at all. These were common sense, you know, notepad. Okay, uh, media, that's big. Okay, how can we get like the biggest media owners? And okay, let's get screens. Let's get advertising agencies. Kids, schools, okay, that's big. How do we get, and, and that's, we ended up doing the world's largest lesson, you know, the world's biggest advertising campaign. And we would have a series of conversations with experts in that area over the course of about three months in our office and ended up designing a really rough brush stroke thing that, and including the workshop, that, which is where I met uh, your wife at. We ended up building it, it through just iterative, iterative conversations based on instinct and common sense. And it worked. You know, we, we just kept going and didn't look down. And I think there was something looking back on that time, that power of trusting your instinct, conversation, keeping it lo-fi and, and listening. And, you know, Richard's dream at the beginning was that we'd get the wheel, you know, the, the Global Goals wheel on every packaging, every piece of packaging in the world. And because from his point of view, why would you not? I've got the head of Unilever part, as part of the negotiations. You know, you have every country, company in the world saying they want to do this, they want to do that. Of course, they'll put it on. So, and we thought, yeah, that would be amazing. Let's, so let's get some really big industry players around the table to chat. And, you know, to a man and woman, they were like, you, that will never happen. And actually, it hasn't. They're right. There's all sorts of reasons why that doesn't happen. Uh, different country regulations, you know, there's a ton of other things already that they're signed up to. You'd have to change the machinery and every different market would be different. And that was a case of, you know, we didn't do everything we wanted to because we listened. Um, I mean, I'm not sure Richard has listened because he still would like the wheel and every packaged good in the, in the world. But we listened for, that for the time being. But mainly people said, okay, I get, I get what you're trying to do. How can we do that? So we, we built this, there was 12 of us, and we built this global launch where our strap line was, we, our strategy was we're going to reach 7 billion people in seven days. 
So and then so one day it was media takeover, one day it was football takeover, one day you know and 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 we think we reached maybe three billion by carefully looking at the maths. But you know a glorious failure, as Richard said, because we did not do seven billion in seven days, but we we did pretty well. Pretty well. It was all right. Yeah. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Maybe um, we could draw attention to the actual visual part of it. Yes. So, because what we want to talk about is how to fuel conversations. And at least, you know, I really recognize this round circular visual with lots of colors on it. I'm sure um, you've seen people wearing pins with it on and so forth. So can you tell us a little bit about the thinking around that and, and how you thought that might Um, fuel conversations on this topic yes of course so you're absolutely right in the premise that if we hadn't done what we did it would have stayed a document and I do have a presentation that I give um, I haven't given it for a while but I have two slides that show the original policy document and then you flip the next slide just shows the the table Um, and it just makes the point that it's so obvious but um does make me sometimes if I'm particularly stressed or, or frustrated, I go back to that slide and say it's okay. We, you know, however rough the going now is, we we, we did that. That 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 was important. Um, and it was it was Richard's. Richard is a visually driven. He's a writer, but actually he has a terrific visual sense. So I think it was his instigation that this needed more visual pizzazz than it has. We also were very conscious of um, the everyone bit. So it had to be visual in a way that was not reliant on language or indeed cultural reference. Um, because what would look amazing if you're choosing a certain set of references, especially if you're using, say, photography, would resonate brilliantly, say, in Southeast Asia, but it wouldn't make any sense at all in, you know, Northern Europe and vice versa. So there was lot, so we knew it had to be visual. We knew um, we needed to be global. We knew it needed to be intergenerational. Um, you know, the, the essence of the mission is to raise a whole generation behind the 2030 generation who grew up just thinking this stuff is normal. Like, of course we want gender equality. Of course we're going to respect the planet. But if you're not teaching them that from the get-go, from, you know, school age, then they're, they're not going to grow into that and you're going to have to start again when they're baked into their sort of old wrong ways, as it were. So it had to appeal to kids as well. And so it's quite a chunky design brief, really. If you think about it, it has to work everywhere. You can't use anything that's too specific. It's got to cover every issue. Um, and it has to be instantly recognizable. The UN did not help in the sense that they um, spat out 17, which is just a rubbish number. <laughs> <laughs> and we were, it was Richard used to say, even God only had 10. So uh, can you really not get it down? Um, we were like, it's 2015. Can't you get it to 15? Like, surely you could put a couple of them together. Um, inequalities in gender. No. Okay. Um, but all of that, of course, was intensely political and being negotiated with 193 member states. So the number was the number. So that was another element of complication. And, and we were, um, in one of our media conversations, and I was talking about how we formed the campaign in, in these specialist dialogues. There's a guy who I had worked for at the BBC. He's now the director general of the BBC. He said, oh, design, and the man you need is, uh, is a Swedish designer called Jakob Trollback. He's brilliant. So we flew. This is the lovely nature of that startup. So Richard and I sort of went, okay, we must meet Jakob. Where is Jakob? Jakob's in New York. Let's go to New York. So we went to New York, and I, I remember it really clearly because it was so uh, pivotal. We'd, we'd done a briefing, obviously, over the phone. This was pre-Zoom, remember? So we hadn't met him. We just had phone calls with him and tried to distill the enormity of this complex brief uh, to his design mind. And so we met in the uh, very swanky bar of the New York Soho House. I was I was one of those life moments where you're sort of looking at yourself on the outside, sort of going in with Richard Curtis, thinking like, this is, this is cool, this is really exciting. <laughs> I think it's the <laughs> second trip I'd taken after the trip to Denmark with him. Um, and, and Jakob comes out, and Jakob is, is, is a great friend to us. And so he went by me saying he's an hilarious caricature of what a Swedish designer would be. Morose, extremely sort of serious. It takes every detail as, you know, as blood. And he had some concepts prepared. And, um, and there was a few routes. And he could obviously, because uh, I've worked in the ad industry long enough, I know the, the presentation trick about the order you present them in and how you present them to show the one that you hope is going to be uh, taken which was the one we've got, uh, very iconic, simple, graphic, bright colours, you know, all the stuff you've seen. 
But there is another route, um, I think as Richard might have asked for it, which had much more humanity in it, photography, lots of young faces from all over the world. And Richard really, lo- his instinct was, I really love that. And um, I remember I could feel, as you do with creatives who, it's not going their way, I could feel Yako sort of deep sort of trauma rising because he didn't agree. But he can't, Richard's so lovely and charming and, you know, brilliant. It's hard to disagree with him creatively. Um it was it was struggling with this point in the meeting and, and then I think Richard must have gone to the bathroom. And I remember Yakov leaning over going, Help me <laughs> Help This is a disaster <laughs> And we go, Okay, I, I agree with you, but so let's like work out how we can and, and Richard came back and he, because he's such a great listener and we argued the toss a bit and we ended up with where we got to. Uh the wheel is interesting. The wheel is there because of seventeen is a crap number to design with. So, you know, there's no shape that looks great in 17, but when you add the wheel, then you can do three rows of six and you have the tablet. And and then a bit later, Jakob and I collaborated with the Swedish government to design the targets, um, which is, again, I think one of those genius strategic switches, which would not have happened if the UN had been left to their own devices. I don't know if you know, I'm sure you do know, you know, each goal has its headline, but then it has its targets and then it has its indicators. And the targets are where I think that they get really granular for people to use the goals. And I think they weren't really being talked about or showcased so much, but when we designed them into the icons of their own, so the ones I can always remember are their life below water targets because they're very sort of cartoony, you know, the, what pollution looks like, what overfishing looks like, what a reef looks like. Uh, businesses particularly really, I think, then leapt in at a target level and they could really see the granularity of what they were trying to achieve. So, um, and I'll keep using the ocean as the example, because I think it's a good one. It's so huge, life below water. I mean, literally, it's the biggest system on earth. And you, as a business, might stand for that. I want, you know, I want to help the life support system, but where do I start? Well, I think once you get to target level, there's some really great places, pollution, plastic, what are you using your offices? You know, you could start ranking yourself against those targets. And I think when they are put into icon form the way we did it, I think it was 2017, we designed up the targets. You could see them being taken off. So it was almost like we proved the case by launching the goals in the first place, designed up and looking gorgeous. And then to come back again with the second album of the targets, as it were, and see them be taken off as well. I think there's a lesson in that about um, learning from what worked and then do it again. There's also, I think there's also a lesson in, in, uh, the power of aesthetics so so immediately when you get an image glued to a story or something there is at least the potential of that being sticky but without that i mean we can all think of photographs that remind us of a certain crisis or a war or something and when we've seen that photograph or something it, you, it can't be erased yeah. and that's what aesthetics uh, can do so I think it's a it's a super super powerful tool to 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 design a conversation by using aesthetics or or design. I agree, and I think sometimes uh, companies industries don't feel uh, that it's sort of somehow appropriate for them to be playful like that. But I, th- I hope this shows that if you know if the United Nations and and all the, with all the seriousness of the goals can can distill themselves into a, a great aesthetic than anyone can and, and and maybe you should consider that for their own expression to themselves, you know, to the to their to their staff, to their clients, because I think it does help. So we talk about transformations and they are long usually and they're big and they're you know moving at some kind of tempo and it's, sometimes it's really difficult to know are we actually moving even even the slightest bit and so what I'd like to to ask you is when it comes to your side of this in terms of communicating around them how do you see that with the the global goals and how do you kind of maintain the motivation to to keep fighting at it when you don't necessarily see all the progress that we would always that we'd wish for yeah it's a really good question i mean on a at a surface level the goals are great to work with because there's because they cover everything there's always something to celebrate you know there's always something gone right somewhere in one of the 17 somewhere in the world so if you're an optimist they're like i am and like richard is too they're a fantastic system to to remain motivated and even at different 
you know, something terrible might have happened politically. Like I remember when um, when Trump got in, we were very worried about progress uh, for the goals in the US, particularly because Trump, uh, the Trump administration was not a fan of the UN at all. I and mean, he made that very known. And he was not a fan of uh, some of the multilateral organizations upon which the goals rely. So that was a very dark sort of shock to our optimism. But then what happened was this incredible uprising of activists in the States, particularly gender activists, uh, LGBTQ, uh, race, all the things that that administration was making noises against had this fantastic equal and opposite effect of, of activism rising. And equally, there can be some, some terrible things going on in the climate world, for example, there's bad science reports. At the same time, a new innovation will come through from the business world or, uh, that, or a regulation from somewhere in the world that makes you think, or Greta will pop up, and you'll take hope from that. So I think it gives you a really brilliant deck upon which there'll always be one of the levers you can turn up or draw your inspiration from. Um, I think if, how long have we been going? We launched in 2015, so seven years, nearly halfway there. Without question, we're, no, we're nowhere near halfway there. Um, I think things were moving uh, very much at different paces in different goals. And the invasion of Ukraine, without question, has set everything back and still unknown. Uh, as to how much and for how long. Um, so that is now a challenge. You know, how, how do you maintain the optimism and energy of that system through what are, without question, currently and going to be tough, tough times for, for everyone? Um, and I think that's where I do draw um, optimism and hope from the business community, particularly, who have adopted them so much because they're useful to them. You know, businesses are good at long-term strategies. They like frameworks. They like um, obvious ways to connect what they're doing with other businesses, investment opportunities, consumers. So I think business will power us through the next few years um, of, of what could be, in terms of humanitarian uh, issues, really, really difficult. But that's, yeah, I think it's, just, it's a palette in which every paint is contained. Like every color is in that palette. So if one is running thin, we'll find another one. If you, if you were to do it again from a conversational point of view and you could turn back the clock and say, okay, we are, we are at the beginning of this. And you were to think about conversations that either didn't happen or, you know, were not right. What, what would, is there anything you could point to that you would do different um, that, you know, from a conversational point of view would have potentially had an even Im uh, larger impact or something that pissed you off in the process that you kind of lo lost the ball or something. I mean, not that I can talk about, I think. Um, I think some, crazy. we were doing it at pace, right? We were doing it at real speed we didn't get to have conversations with some of the major players in the individual goal areas as much as we might have liked in order to knit them in to the whole system going forward. So whether they are some of the bigger UN agencies who are, you know, support have been supporting some of these individual goals for ages or some of the outside actual up and running movements. So that this is where it won't, I won't name things because that would be too political. But mm. I think had we had the time to um, understand what this system and we might have felt like coming in to somebody who'd been doing this work for 10 or even 20 years, then we may have um, been able to knit ourselves together as one force rather than what may, I guess, have looked like splitting the force and like, oh, here's another thing. Yeah. And then because we were a good thing and a shiny thing and we, you know, we had the potency of UN and Richard and, and then increasingly Bill Gates this and Beyonce that, I fear that might have caused resentment that is mm. not helpful. I think, I think you're, you're onto something because I think some people, it's a big enough cause so you can't not be part of it. But, but especially in the beginning, there was, there could be a sense of exclusion being excluded you ran with the story you had the cool narrative where am i in this and and i guess that's what you're pointing to that how how can we align with the forces that are working with us to a large extent than being too obsessed with our own story and owning it yes yeah, yeah. and it's really hard isn't it to be fully inclusive of absolutely everyone and everything whilst not diluting your own focus mm -hmm. is is hard um, there was a brilliant story where I thought, wow, we really have arrived of the pin symbolizing a cult. I don't know if you read that. There's, no. It was an Australian 
a uh, conspiracy theory that started but like broke out globally on the internet where it was like an Illuminati thing and they were showing pictures of like look that world leader's wearing the badge she's wearing the badge you know that rock star's wearing the badge and then they were having these sort of brilliant mad voiceover things uh, about the, this cult of the global gods <laughs> it's really funny um, and obviously that's not true but I can see why it would look like that if you're um, not in our world at all and you're you know people that's how conspiracy theories start isn't it and we've had a few instances where people sort of want to say, oh, we're going to do a project everyone for this region or my town. And can I, can I, and they've been maybe using our name and, and saying that they're like official and you want to go with that energy and go, that's amazing. But sometimes what they're doing is not, uh, whatever, uh, acceptable to the UN or, uh, within the main campaign beat. And so that is a tension. How do you, how do you harness everyone and everything, um, without it going, um, a, a, a sort of, wrong or just diluted so uh, that is hard and but i think at, a, at those big org levels i mean when we launched them and did this jazzy week with the big projections on the un and meet takeovers on google and wikipedia and all, all 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 really great we all got back to london eventually and we're sort of taking stock and and, and richard was I remember really optimistic that we could just do a ring round i mean literally just ring all the biggest charities all the biggest businesses all the biggest sort of campaign units and they'd all just put it front and center because it almost like the answer has come. And, you know, it, 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 they did not, <laughs> you know, because we, I think we'd, la we'd missed an opportunity, we'd missed a year, basically. If we'd had another year where we could have really thought, how is this going to land? Let's listen to who's out there who are already fighting for these amazing things. And let's work out how we can be supportive to them as well as doing the job the UN needs, which is launching these things. Um, and that, that's really a, a large part of our work now, uh, at, especially when it comes down to activists in those areas. Let's find the, the people who are marching. You know, let's find the people who are doing their own uh, beach cleanups and doing their own restoration projects all over the world and say, well, how could we help you? You know, we've got loads of things that you could, maybe could be helpful to you, like connections, like, you know, influence and power. And you have so much that we could learn from. So how can we work with you? But that, you know, that is hard work. That is as hard. It's not hard. It's great work. It's, but it's laborious. You know, it takes time. And, it, you know, it's not the model we started with, which was very much top down, noisy. Let's build a movement. Now we're trying to also connect it to the, to the roots. And, and, and that's very much Amina Muhammad's um, message now as well is that these goals need to be taken nationally, they need to be taken regionally, they need to be taken locally. You know, what do they mean to you and how can you live them in your life? Because that's the real step change, I think, to do next. It's not like we've done as much as we can do and we will continue to be the noisy kind of jazzy people that, that you know, the Pied Pipers of the movement, as it were. And we want to connect into those grassroots levels so that the movement can be one movement. How do you um, make noise and kind of focus differently um, at the different levels? So I'm just thinking, um, of course, you'll want leaders and businesses and countries and so forth to be engaged in this conversation, but also some kid at home might see this and be curious. So when your, your uh, audience is so broad, what are some of the th things that you think um, when you're putting together the communication or the initiatives that you launch it yeah it's what do i think i think um i think i need therapy and i need a year <laughs> off because it really my husband calls it project everything all the time um because that's that is in a nutshell the hub of the challenge it is for everyone about everything um richard has a brilliantly simplifying phrase which is to make things happen you have to make things and that carries you a long way actually so we've made some things uh, which can hit different groupings of people uh, and meet them hopefully where their needs are. So you mentioned children. One of the launch things we did was to create this world's largest lesson all based on uh, teaching all kids everywhere about the goals. And we've continued to do that. So that is a program that we do um, in all the languages um, and it rotates themes every year. But we, we think we're in about, we think we've taught about 100 million kids um, or enabled teachers to teach. Um, and that figure is probably higher now, actually. Um, so that's a sort of distinct focus. Another thing that we make in terms of make things happen, do you have to make things? We do a lot of real world convenings at the places where people are. So this is how we get the leaders. So we go to things like the UNGA, the World Economic Forum, Can Lions, COP increasingly. And we make sure that in those rooms, 
we create an experience where, sure, we get the business leaders in and we also get the uh, politicians, the political leaders in, which normally means you get a bit of celebrity in there as well because that's what they like being next to. But we make sure increasingly that in that room is also the activist, you know, is also the community organiser. Um, so that everyone's getting what everybody needs. You know, the business leaders feel authentic. The organizers get to meet the people who've got the money, who've got the influence that they need to shift their community. So increasingly uh, that, and especially post-pandemic, the, the energy to do that is off the scale again. I'm sure you're feeling it too. So we've done, I think, two, we did a whole COP in Glasgow, which is back-to-back convening, convening, convening. Um, and that was amazing. I think it really helps shift the dial and it joins people up so that, what is a mad target audience of everyone can get distilled and focused around an issue at that point in time. And hopefully stone in a pond kind of model, the ripples can then be felt until we get together again. But it, it, I mean, it is hard. That is the hardest thing about the job. The job what do relentless. you actually do? Like when you, when you say you're convening things and, and you, you want to spark conversations on this topic at those very important sort of conferences and, and things, what, is it a set of questions? Do you heavily facilitate dialogue or, you know, very concretely, what what do you bring into that space? <laughs> Again, that's another, <laughs> that's another question of my nightmares. What do you actually do, dot com? Um, yeah, we heavily curate and manage the conversation. So the three words that I rule by, my life by whenever we're anywhere near one of those conference cycles is run of show. <laughs> What's the run of show? Who's hosting? What's the theme and the topic? What's the narrative arc we want to get from A to B? It's like a show. And increasingly, especially at you know, some conferences more than others, it is a show. Like we'll bring a performer in. We did this amazing one recently at the World Economic Forum um, where we run a, a venue called The Goals House. And we, run, we pop up like a members club, but all those places. And um, we did a goals dinner with uh, Bill Gates was there. And um, that means lots of pe- other people want to be there. So that's the way that works. And but then we had some brilliant activists from around uh, the, the world. Brought Ina Moja, the musician in, who's also the champion behind the Great Green Wall project in Africa. And the frame of it all is the world's to-do list. What's what's on your to-do list? Because we've turned these goals into 17 to-do post-its. Um, and that was how people had to interject in the conversation was like, tell us what's on your to-do list and tell us who you need to get it done. And it was amazingly simple. The more specific you can frame your intervention, actually, the more people like that and the richer it becomes. So we that's the kind of stuff we do. So you're likely to have a very tightly controlled topic. I moderate a lot, but also we get journalists, great, make great moderators sometimes, and just make sure that everyone uh, felt, feels held and focused on what it is they're contributing to that narrative. Um, and then we increasingly try and bring in more listening practice at those dinners. I mean, I do think we do this well, it breaks my heart and makes me furious if I go to an event where people are on their phones and they're not listening. And I can't believe so, that that happens in those places. It Can happens imagine? so <laughs> much. I think not in the Goals House because if I'm facilitating, I now it's like teaching children at carpet time. I call it out at the beginning, middle and end if I see it happening. It makes me furious. It does happen. Um, but um, increasingly, I think it's unacceptable. Um, and I think the kind of alchemy that you can weave by bringing in the performer, the expert, the policy person, the world leader, the business person, the innovator. I think one of the accents that we always bring to our convenings is solution. What is possible? What are you doing? What have you seen that works? What are you, if you're a scientist, what are you working on? Because no one has moved really to action through despair or through um, moral duty. I think my observation, and I, th- I believe it to be sort of written about, People either move through brute fear, like personal fear, which most of us don't live in. We're lucky enough not to live in that situation day to day. Or they're moved by hope. You know, so I think if you, I've, I've seen rooms really come to life where you do start with a bit of the context, but you really quickly move people into what's on your to-do list. How are you getting that done? And there's nothing can move a room to action more than actual proof of change. And so, so we seek those people all over the world. And if we can't bring them in and during the pandemic, obviously no one could go anywhere. We, um, we will film them. We'll, we'll send cameras to where they are and bring them into the room that way. So we are building this, one of the biggest legacies, I think, of Project Everyone, even halfway through, and certainly will be the case by 2030, is this goals ecosystem that 
we have accident, you know, passively built, but it's there. So if someone says, I really do care about the ocean, I want to do plastic, but how can we fix this problem? We can like, we're like those funny minority report people in our brains. We can, okay, the answer is it's that person and she's in Grand Bahamia and she's just won the Earthshot Prize, but yes, we can ring her and blah. Boom, change done. I think the biggest thing for me at the moment is time. I don't have any. They don't, the goals don't have any. <laughs> the world doesn't have any. So how can we do the deep work and the listening and the stuff that does take the time but also where are the hacks, right? Where's the acts, where's the shortcuts that we can make to get the progress going? So I think the ecosystem and, and, and access into that ecosystem is a really powerful thing that we try and curate and manage, you know, for the world. It's not, we don't own it, we're a nonprofit, but I, I hope we uh, are building it every day. For sure. I think for, for sure you've given us hope in, in, uh, in this. And it is, I think it's a beautiful story about, uh, as we started out talking about a movement, something that's turned into a movement. So I think it is, super inspiring in any change project you're part of and and uh, lending from your or being inspired by your narrative around uh, what, what you've actually achieved through a piece of insight that is maybe seven, eight years old. So thank you. Maybe we could just finish off by doing a very quick round of the takeaway. I think when applying it to transformation, whether it be in this field or in, in any field, um, and, and the takeaway I'm going away with is just the playfulness that you have brought into this, even the visual and everything that you try to do, the communication that I see, that makes it into something that I want to pay attention to. So when, when, Thinking about transformation elsewhere, that's definitely something I'm going to take forward. What about you, Steve? Your inclusiveness, the way you dared to um, to include people that you couldn't control and allowed yourself to lean in and see where they took it. I think that's something we can all learn from. We have a tendency, most of us, to try to control a transformation from A to B. And I think this is a beautiful story about something that was more a movement and less a, 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 a fixed journey from A to B. And I think it's partly because you involved a lot of people that had their own view and angles on this. So I, uh, that's a takeaway for me. Is there something that you'd like to say as a top of mind takeaway um, as we go out of this conversation? I'd probably just slightly concur with both of yours. Um, I think we have to carry on ceding control you know, to the people who... Are going to, we're all achieving these goals. So how you achieve them is going to be different to how I achieve them. And that is challenging when working with big funding structures, UN, et cetera. But I think I, I, the more I do the work, the more I learn that that's the way we'll do less, almost control less to achieve more. And then just to concur with your playful thought, Katrina, I remember very early on, again, feeling extremely new in the scene and accidentally ending up on a panel about green finance, about which I knew precisely nothing at the time. But I think I'd been, I'd said yes, because it was a company with, who was supporting the goals. And then when I got there, I thought, oh, hi, see, you don't have any women on the panel. So I was, so I, because there was, you know, economist here, Stern there, Paul Pullman was next to me. And Paul uh, was the one who'd asked for the, if I joined, and obviously head of Unilever, a very clever man. And the questions were, it was a nightmare. And they were coming thick and fast about, did I thought, think that the, national, the new green bond that the government of Denmark had brought was stronger than the previous one that the government of Chile had tried in, you know, 85? I was like, oh my God. And I thought there's only so many times I can defer the question to other people. But Paul leant over at one point and I, I was really mortified. I thought he was going to lean over and sort of tell me off. And he went, do you know, I just love the films that you make. Fantastic. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's so funny. But that, that is how we are perceived. But it's in his mind. And he's an he's a amazing advocate for the goals. He's an SDG advocate and he helped the negotiations. But the bit that we add, the value add, is the play and the creativity. And that make things happen. You have to make things. And so that's, I think that's why it's such a joy. That's how we can cope with the, what would otherwise be absolute schizophrenia-inducing ADHD permanently state of mind that is all goals all the time everywhere with no hope with no sort of guarantee of achieving them at all um, is the play just keep playing and and, uh, and see where it goes thank you so much for your time with us today Gail you're welcome it's fun if you're interested to follow up on any of the references in this episode follow the link in the episode description Thanks for listening. 
Remember, you're never not in conversation. So stay curious out there. See you next time.